coming up on the remarkable 20th century. I say we stand upon our government and we battle for the Lord. This was the war to end all wars. It was very forceful and radical. Wilson tried to create international order. The teenagers of the 20th century showed early signs of becoming an agreeable, mildly progressive interlude. Abroad, the funeral of King Edward VII of Britain had brought the leaders of the world together, and the vision of the royals of England, Germany, and Russia sharing condolences and breaking bread together seemed an assurance of peaceful relationships. In America, Woodrow Wilson, the progressive president of Princeton, was elected president of the United States. His vote total added to that of his progressive opponent, showed the nation's temper pretty unified on progressive goals. Consensus promised temperate politics. The income tax amendment annoyed some. The sinking of the Titanic shocked all. But nothing happened that the spirit of the times couldn't handle. Disasters struck suddenly. The powers of Europe committed themselves to mutual destruction, said the Washington Post at the time, over contentions that a police court could adjust in a week. With marvels like the 600 bullets a minute machine gun now in place, the war would soon justify its name, the Great War. The German Kaiser precipitated it without any clear purpose. Germany had been rising to preeminence from natural causes. If Wilhelm had been asked what he wanted from the war, he could only have answered more quicker. The war would prove the seminal disaster of the 20th century. It would take the rest of the century up to 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union before the ills it caused could be remedied and the unprecedented loss of life never could be. Now, the aborted era of goodwill, 1910 to 1920. The world found itself in a period of optimistic transition. The pioneering accomplishments, progress, and technological innovation of the century's first decade pushed the world forward, confident about its future. Since the advent of the Industrial Revolution, European nations were enjoying a steady growth in population, foreign trade, and industrial capability. Politically, pacts and policies held the monarchies of Europe together, ensuring what appeared to be on the surface a lasting peace. In May of 1910, the monarchs of Europe gathered in London, England to honor the passing of King Edward VII, who died suddenly of pneumonia at the age of 68. The late King Edward had eight brothers and sisters, and most of them had married into other royal families. Princess Alexandra, King Edward's niece, was married to the ruling Romanov in Russia, Tsar Nicholas II. King Edward's sister, Victoria, had married the German emperor, Frederick III, and her son was the current Kaiser Wilhelm II. It was no wonder that Edward's funeral attracted the most prominent members of the ruling class. From 70 different nations came the most dignified of dignitaries, including former President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. Behind the casket of the deceased king followed a royal procession including nine crowned heads of Europe and Edward's son, the new King of England, George V. The fact that we see monarchs from the different European countries being friendly with one another at the funeral of Edward VII in 1910 doesn't really tell us that much about what's really going on in the politics of the early 20th century. At this point, monarchs, of course, are more symbolic and figurehead within the politics of a country than they are really players in the politics of the period. And so what's really happening on the ground has nothing to do with the ways in which monarchs will be able to in interact with one another at these largely symbolic and formal occasions such as funerals. A restless undercurrent was subtly spreading across Europe. Rivalries and suspicion between the continental powers simmered as competition for world markets increased. The rivalries led to military expansion 
and the formation of two hostile military alliances, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, and the Triple Entente of Great Britain, France, and Russia. Germany, under the leadership of Kaiser Wilhelm II, continually fueled the fire, seeking a more active role in world affairs and continued German expansion. Germany was a late comer in industrialization compared to Western neighbors, but became the most developed industrialized country of Europe up to the 1910s. So it was a major gap between the new strengths of Germany and the political status of Germany within Europe or within the world. Against this backdrop, 1910 America, under the leadership of President William Howard Taft, remained neutral and isolated, absorbed in the enjoyment of all things new. Meanwhile, the United States neighbor, Mexico, was experiencing the beginnings of its own political upheaval. 1910 marked the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution, led by Francisco Madero, who campaigned against the presidency of Porfirio Diaz, who had been in power for 30 years. The discontent that many social classes and groups in Mexico had over the lack of opportunities, social, economic, politically, that the entrenched government of Porfirio Diaz had had for so long, just made the revolution inevitable. Diaz had Madero jailed. When he was released a year later, Madero orchestrated an uprising against Diaz and assumed power. In 1910, panic and paranoia of impending doom swept the world when Halley's Comet was observed in its elliptical orbit. Named after the English astronomer Edmund Halley, who first sighted it in 1682, the comet is a phenomenon occurring every 76 years. 1910 was also the year race car driver Barney Oldfield set the land speed record, reaching a then unbelievable 130 miles per hour. Oldfield was one of America's first race car drivers, setting speed records since the turn of the century. Nineteen eleven was the year British explorer Robert Scott and the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen set out on a race to be the first men to reach the South Pole. On December fourteenth, Amundsen and his party reached the pole first. Twenty-five days later, Scott's team arrived, but they failed to make it home when they tragically perished in a savage blizzard just 11 miles from their base camp. On a more cheerful note, 25-year-old Russian immigrant Irving Berlin published Alexander's Ragtime Band, a song that redefined popular music. Another sound traveled up from the Mississippi Delta by way of musicians Jelly Roll Morton, Blind Lemon Jefferson, and the father of the blues, W.C. Handy, who, in 1914, wrote the immortal St. Louis Blues, one of the most recorded songs in the history of music. In April of 1912, the RMS Titanic, the largest man-made object of the day, set sail on its first transatlantic journey from England to New York. Billed as unsinkable and the world's safest ocean liner, the 882-and-a-half-foot, 46,000-ton ship cost nearly seven-and-a-half million dollars and boasted every modern convenience except enough lifeboats. the ship hit an iceberg. In the early morning of April 15th, the lifeboat problem became all too apparent. More than 1,500 people went down with the ship, perishing in the frigid 28-degree North Atlantic waters. Meanwhile, the mood in the American political arena also ran cold. After taking office in 1909, President William Howard Taft opposed many of the policy matters of his fellow Republican and former president, Teddy Roosevelt. In 1912, Roosevelt challenged Taft for the nomination of the Republican Party. To you who strive in a spirit of brotherhood for the betterment of our nation, I say we stand the Obama, Janet, and we battle for the law. 
When Roosevelt lost the Republican nomination, he joined the Progressive Party, founded by Senator Robert La Follette of Wisconsin, and campaigned on the Bull Moose ticket. The progressives wanted to affect some kind of social change and, and have some kind of social responsibility. They wanted to get rid of the tenements. They wanted to get rid of urban overcrowding. They wanted to get rid of the slums. They wanted to make some sort of social fabric knit more closely together for the country, I think. When November came, neither Taft nor Roosevelt were victorious. Woodrow Wilson was elected the 28th president of the United States. Describing himself as a progressive with the brakes on, Wilson made his debut in presidential politics with a campaign consisting primarily of domestic reform. One issue was women's suffrage. With the role of women taking on an increasingly bigger role outside of the home in business and industry, suffragettes continued their battle to gain equal rights for women. Women's suffrage really started in the mid-1800s because women, uh, mainly white women, but also free black women who had been active in the, an in the abolitionist movement to abolish slavery, discovered, if they didn't already know, that they were in the same spot in many ways. That is, they were chattel, they were possessions. So having been politicized by that, they started to campaign uh, to be able to vote. Where leaders Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton left off, a new generation of leaders such as England's Emmeline Pankhurst picked up. Emmeline Pankhurst's organization has had more publicity than anyone else because they simply were involved in theatrical and dramatic and, and, and terrorist activity in a way that women had just not done before. They were throwing knives at politicians. They were heckling, which women had never done before, at public meetings. They were slashing famous paintings. They were chaining themselves to railings. In a very famous incident in 1913, one activist threw herself in front of a racehorse at a famous horse competition. All of these kinds of tactics were not what women, the gentle people, had been involved in in the 19th century. Like the British, American suffragettes also campaigned vigorously for voting rights. The most adamant groups picketed government institutions, and some women even went as far as to initiate hunger strikes. In May of 1912, 15,000 women paraded down New York's Fifth Avenue in one of the largest demonstrations of American women in history. It was very forceful and radical, and only that degree of strength earned a legal identity as human beings for, for women. In the world of sports, legendary athlete Jim Thorpe won the decathlon and the pentathlon in the 1912 Summer Olympics. Baseball great Ty Cobb batted over 400 for the second straight year in 1912. His extraordinary 24-year career in the major leagues led him to become the first player inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1936. In 1913, Henry Ford unveiled his assembly line, an ingenious process of building automobiles. He could uh, mass produce that car uh, to a scale that the price came way down. And indeed, Henry Ford's, uh, one of his objectives was to make the automobile available to, to everybody with a few hundred dollars. As for his employees, Ford doubled his workers' wages and offered profit sharing within the company. Another new economic idea was adopted in 1913 when the U.S. Congress passed the 16th Amendment implementing a federal income tax. The Panama Canal was finally completed after 10 years of construction. At a cost of nearly $350 million, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers excavated 143 cubic kilometers of earth and battled yellow fever and malaria to join the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans across the Isthmus of Panama. In Mexico, tensions flared again in 1913 when President Madero was murdered. Right-wing Army General Victoriano Huerta seized power and civil war soon followed. Wilson, concerned over Mexico's political unrest and Germany's continuing interest in Mexico, refused to recognize Huerta and sent troops to the Mexican port of Veracruz to prevent the shipment of German arms. Eventually, Mexican revolutionists drove Huerta from power, and he fled to Germany. Wilson recognized the leadership of Venustio Carranza and withdrew American troops. 
1913 was a pivotal year in the world of art. At the first international exhibition of modern art in New York, the American public was introduced to the European avant-garde. Picasso, Braque, Matisse, and Duchamp, whose painting Nude Descending a Staircase bewildered exhibit goers and forced critics to reevaluate artistic conventions. By 1913, abstract art had revolutionized painting and sculpture. In Russia, Vasily Kandinsky, a painter from Moscow, garnered attention by blatantly rejecting the use of figurative elements and replacing them with a bedlam of vibrant color and geometric shapes. Kandinsky would prove to be among the most influential painters of his time. In 1913, Parisian concert goers were outraged while attending the premiere of Russian composer Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. The score received a hailstorm of condemnation, but it would go on to become one of the most celebrated compositions of the 20th century. Meanwhile, a new art form was gaining popularity. By the middle of the decade, five million people a day went to see the latest picture show. In 1914, the center of filmmaking moved from New York to a small dry town in Southern California called Hollywood. D.W. Griffith pioneered the language of film. By 1913, he had directed over 400 one-reel movies, and that same year, he embarked on his greatest film to date, The Birth of a Nation. Premiering in 1915, the three-hour extravaganza recounting the Civil War set a new cinematic standard and became the first movie shown in the White House. I used to get under the table and listen to my father and his friends talk about the battles they'd been through and their struggles. First things impressed you deeply. Now I suppose that got into the birth. President Woodrow Wilson said the impact of Birth of a Nation was like writing history with lightning. Audiences and critics agreed. It was about something. You can tell easily a story about something. It was about a tremendous struggle. About a story of people that were fighting desperately against great odds, great sacrifice, suffering, death. Although controversial then and now for its racial stereotypes, the movie still packs a punch with its visual skill and creativity. Griffith's camera moves like no other from the silent era, and his close-up shots of actors effectively put the audience closer to the characters on screen. The director was also a master of cross-cutting, keeping the audience on the edge of their seats by editing between different events happening at the same time. Audiences were dazzled, and Birth of a Nation helped establish the movies as a legitimate art form. Max Sennett, a Griffith protege, brought laughs to the silent screen with the first of over 500 Keystone Cop shorts. In 1914, he produced the first feature-length comic film, Tilly's Punctured Romance. The film starred the ever-popular Marie Dressler and a British music hall comedian, Charlie Chaplin. By the end of the decade, Chaplin was commanding $1 million a year, producing and starring in movies based on his brilliant comic creation, The Tramp. Other stars flourished. Douglas Fairbanks thrilled audiences. Theda Berra created one of the screen's first sex symbols. Gladys Smith changed her name to Mary Pickford and became America's sweetheart. Women forged new territory on the social front as well. An unknown nurse named Margaret Sanger addressed the taboo subject of birth control and urged women to challenge the pro-conception idea. For this, she faced an obscenity charge and fled to Europe. Two years later, she returned and opened the first birth control clinic in Brooklyn. In Europe, tensions simmered and the hope for world peace spiraled downward. After two Balkan wars in 1912 and 1913, tension between Serbia and Austria-Hungary grew over the Slavic region of southern Bosnia, which Austria-Hungary had annexed in 1908. Hostility reached the boiling point on June 28, 1914, when the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife Sophia 
were assassinated by a young Serbian while visiting the Bosnian city of Sarajevo. Archduke Franz Ferdinand wasn't liked especially by the Serbs because the Serbs were afraid that what he wanted to do was to try and bring the Serbian ethnic group that lived in the Austrian Empire on a more equal plane. One of the problems that the Austrian Empire always faced was the fact that these ethnic groups within the empire were unhappy with German control, unhappy with Hungarian control. And they were always looking for some kind of autonomy, self-rule, and Franz Ferdinand was sympathetic to that idea. And he was willing to grant to these Serbs a better participation in the government, have more of a political voice in the Austrian Empire. The Serbs in Serbia wouldn't like that. They would not like happy Serbs in the Austrian Empire because happy Serbs in the Austrian Empire would not want to split and become part of Serbia. And the Serbian nationalists were unhappy, therefore, with this guy. So when he went down to Sarajevo to visit the governor, the Serbs saw the possibility if we could create a crisis in which the Austrian government would become so unhappy with the Serbian population in their own government, maybe they'd let them go, they'd let them join Serbia. So a certain nationalist group, a terrorist group, decided that they would assassinate the Archduke. When Serbian terrorists killed this Archduke, the Austrians naturally were going to send an ultimatum, which they knew the Serbians would not recognize. They knew the Serbians would reject it. The Austrian government wanted a war with Serbia. In late July, Austria-Hungary attacked Serbia and war was declared. Before long, the European military alliances went into effect and the war broke out on three fronts. With the central powers of Germany, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Austria-Hungary opposing the allied forces of Great Britain, France, Russia, Belgium, and eventually Italy, and three years later, the United States. Serbia was allied to Russia. Serbia had depended on Russia when she got her independence back in 1804. And therefore, the Russians and the Serbs had always been sort of closely aligned. They were Slavic, they had the same language, Orthodox religion. There were some natural connections there. So Russia made this alliance with Serbia and said that if you are attacked by anybody, we will come to your defense. So naturally, when Austria declared war against Serbia, it brought Russia into the war. But when Russia came into the war, Germany said, if you are attacked by Russia, we'll come in and support you. And that brought Germany into the war. France came in because they had the alliance with Russia, and they now joined the war against Germany. And then Britain came into the war because Germany violated the neutrality of Belgium, which was a neutral country. Then the British came into the war, and that's how those sides are lined up for the war itself. In 1914, when the war began, Germany was pursuing a plan that they've been developing for years called the Schlieffen Plan. This involved a wide flanking movement around the right flank through Belgium, which would then take Paris. Then they would face about to fight the Russians. The logic was that the French were more able to mobilize quickly than the Russians. So they would strike the French first, then face about, and then destroy the Russians. Of course, the French also had a plan. The French plan was the Plan 17, and their plan was to advance into Germany through Lorraine. So you really had sort of a pivot. The Germans were coming into France this side, the French were going into Germany on this side. The German army surged into Belgium in August and continued toward France. Bursting with confidence, Germany boasted they'd have Paris for lunch and Russia for dinner. In August, German troops under the leadership of Generals Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff defeated the Russians at the Battle of Tannenberg. The battle signaled the war's first major victory and propelled Hindenburg and Ludendorff to hero status. The Germans tried to break the Western Line in Belgium, but met strong resistance from French troops in the First Battle of the Marne, also known as the Miracle on the Marne. The Allies drove the Germans back 40 to 50 miles north of the Aisne River. Many felt the war would end sooner than later and everyone would be home for Christmas. But by the end of 1914, both the Allies and the Central Powers, having suffered losses of 1.5 million, dug into the earth, building a line of trenches. A line of trenches reaching from Switzerland, across France, through Belgium to the sea. 
over 400 miles of front, thousands of actual miles of trench line, tunnels and dugouts. The whole war went underground. And I was there from uh, uh, June in 1915 until around May in 19, uh, 1917. In fact, we lived in the trenches for two and a half years in, in, in turn. Uh, when I first went into the uh, frontline trenches, it, it wasn't that active. It, there was a lot of overhead shooting, but uh, it, it was a trench warfare, and everybody was down underground, so it, it really wasn't a great uh, hazard or danger to start in on, on, on the first. Is uh, the progressively, why, uh, as we moved and we started going over the trenches, why that changed the situation then. You're just lucky you, you didn't get hit. Trench warfare brought the war to a stalemate. Charging into no man's land to face machine guns, exploding artillery shells, and barbed wire was futile. The military tactic gained little for both sides, but an appalling loss of life. You get a machine gun that's firing 50 rounds a minute and swinging back and forth on the open, it, it, it knocks down, has to knock down a lot of people, even though it's not aimed at them. To say one man in a trench is worth 10 on the, on the ground walking in. On the dawn of April 15, 1915, a strange green cloud wafted from the German front toward the Allies. It was a lethal gas that settled in the trenches, producing immediate blindness and scarring destroying lungs and skin. Both sides used mustard gas. Unpredictable weather conditions and troop concentrations made it difficult to control. Up on this hill there, we come upon an outfit just like mine, only German. They must have just got gas killed. This guy was coming up out of a dugout, perfectly dead, but he didn't fall down. And there was guys stooped over. He was perfectly dead. Other guys were on their horses. They were laying down, just killed them instantly. While the stalemate continued on the Western Front, the Allies set sight on the Dardanelles, a strategic supply route for Russia. British and Australian troops landed ashore on the Gallipoli Peninsula in April of 1915, only to be met by strong Turkish resistance from the cliffs overhead. The Battle of Gallipoli waged for nearly nine months and resulted in great loss of life and complete failure. Without recourse, the Allies were forced to withdraw. Despite the Great War's destructiveness, it introduced new technologies that found valuable peacetime uses. Sonar, used against submarines in the war, developed into a tool for fishermen and mariners. Lightweight alloys contributed to industry. The use of tanks helped develop better tractors. By war's end, thousands of trained pilots were freed to fly mail and passengers. In an effort to help win the war, the United States implemented an idea that started in Great Britain called Daylight Savings. Whether or not this had any effect on the war's outcome has never been conclusively determined. As the land war deadlocked, superiority at sea became critical. The Germans responded with an insidious new weapon, the U-boat. At the outset of the war, Germany had 33 U-boats, 28 fitted for long-range missions. Armed with torpedoes, U-boats harassed enemy ships with surprising success. At the height of the war, U-boats sank an average of 10 ships a day, many of which were non-combatant vessels. On May 7, 1915, the British steamship Lusitania was sunk without warning by a U-boat torpedo off the coast of Ireland. 1,198 were drowned. 138 of them American, and President Wilson threatened to sever relations with Germany and join the Allied side. Germany made no apology, stating the ship was issued a warning and might have been carrying war supplies. President Wilson walked a diplomatic tightrope, not only with the Allied nations, but also with the citizens at home. Huge numbers of nationalities, who were now a part of the American fabric, each held various stakes in the conflict. I think we have to remember that most immigrants from Europe came to this country to get away from Europe. There was a general anti-European feeling in the United States so far as being involved in the European war. Yet in reality, 
America was already part of the war, as the Allies looked to American industry and financing for help. The European War was not the only conflict to concern the United States. Tensions were flaring once again in Mexico, as the leadership of Venustiano Carranza faced opposition from rebel leaders, General Francisco Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. On March 16, 1916, the strain gave way to conflict. A contingency of raiders under Villa's command rode into Columbus, New Mexico, and killed more than 15 Americans. Villa attacked Columbus, feeling that they were supporting his rival, uh, Venustiano Carranza. The American government was very angry and dispatched uh, General Pershing to go into Mexico and capture Francisco Villa. Pershing never found Villa, and Carranza became concerned that U.S. forces had moved too far into his country. The concern escalated into a series of skirmishes between the U.S. Army and Carranza's troops. President Wilson, uneasy about the heightening tensions, negotiated a settlement with Carranza, and U.S. troops left Mexico in January 1917. Across the Atlantic, Germany bolstered its western line with troops from the Eastern Front and in February attacked the French town and fortress of Verdun. The bloody battle waged on until December 1916 with no decisive outcome, claiming almost three quarters of a million lives. In the summer of 1916, the Allies, led by the British, launched their own offensive at the First Battle of the Somme. Blasting 1.5 million artillery shells toward the dug-in Germans and introducing the modern tank, the British gained about 125 square miles of territory, but the drive did not bring about a breakthrough. As in Verdun, the toll was great. I think there was over a million soldiers died between the Germans and the French, because that was a constant battle, heavy all the time. The only way they'd ever come out of there is either be carried out or, or buried, one of the two. In face of the stalemate, modern machinery became a must. Tanks for breaching barbed wire, flamethrowers to incinerate dug-in defenders, and dirigibles, or zeppelins, for high-altitude scouting. But these large airships proved cumbersome next to airplanes. Reconnaissance is the big mission, the important mission at the beginning of the war and throughout the war. You know, the pilots found out very quickly reconnaissance couldn't be accomplished if the other guy came over and tried to keep you from it. So how did you stop him? Well, you took a pistol up, you took a rifle, or he took a pistol and he took a rifle, and you start banging away at each other. In 1915, Dutch aviation pioneer Anthony Fokker, working for the Germans, invented a device that timed a machine gun fire between prop strokes. The fighter plane was born, and so was the air ace. That's the cult of the ace, the knight in his charger fighting the clean fight with his uh, enemy in these beautiful heavens far above the uh, mud and blood and desolation that's taking place in the trenches. This is a very important part of World War I. It's the part that captures the public imagination. There's your bed be up there, circling around and around, and we'd be, we'd be down there with our guns, and, and they'd be up there frightened, two of them, two little, two little planes, you know, biplanes, and they'd be frightened, and all of a sudden, one of them would come down. German ace Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, downed a record 80 planes in dogfights while American Eddie Rickenbacker downed 26 enemy planes. The average lifespan of a pilot was three weeks. 50,000 airmen, nearly one-third of the war's pilots, did not live to see armistice. As the war waged on, European art and science pushed forward in 1916. In France, 76-year-old Claude Monet began work on what would be called the Sistine Chapel of Impressionism. 
Monet painted his famed water lilies onto several enormously long canvases and offered to donate his work to the French nation. German scientist Albert Einstein published his general theory of relativity, stating that gravity is not a force, but a curved field in the space-time continuum, created by mass. Three years later, the Royal Society of London validated his theory. June of 1916 witnessed Russia's last stand on the Eastern Front. Russian General Alexei Brusilov initiated a bold offensive and recovered considerable territory in Austria-Hungary. However, the cost was staggering. Another million Russian men perished, further draining Russia's military strength. A morally defeated and nearly bankrupt Russia was on the verge of collapse. Russian society was in a desperate situation because of five years of the war, the, the exhaustion, the terrible uh, human losses, uh, poverty and starvation. Therefore, it became a good soil, a prepared soil for a left-wing revolution. It was the beginning of the end for Tsar Nicholas II and his regime. While the Tsar's legacy faded, November of 1916 brought another political victory for President Wilson as he was elected to another term in office. With most Americans still favoring isolationism, Wilson's victory was credited to his campaign promise of keeping America out of the war. Wilson made a famous speech in January of 1917. Uh, the phrase was, peace without victory, where there would be an arbitrated peace that would bring the uh, war to an end. Uh, there was some interest in this in, in Europe, particularly amongst the Germans. But then the Germans, by a series of stupid mistakes, really forced us into the war. There was an intercepted telegram, the so-called Zimmerman telegram, uh, where the Germans approached the Mexican government, uh, suggesting a Mexican, German, and Japanese alliance uh, against the United States, which would then support a reconquest of Texas, New Mexico, California, and Arizona from the United States. The Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. Hundreds of thousands of tons of shipping were being sunk every month. Early April 1917, Wilson asked the Congress for a declaration of war, and on the 6th of April, Congress so declared. President Wilson quickly exercised a spectacular mobilization of the nation's resources and industry. Training camps sprouted up across the country, swelling the army from 200,000 to 4 million men during the war. Musicians like George M. Cohen contributed by writing patriotic songs. Over there, over there. His Over There became the bugle call for the war. Stars like Douglas Fairbanks, Marie Dressler, and Charlie Chaplin encouraged the public to support the war effort. Liberty bonds, purchased by nearly half of the American people, raised $21 billion, roughly 65% of the total cost of the war. Women left the confines of their homes to help build tanks and airplanes, filling the gaps in the industrial labor force left by the men. Some served as nurses in the Red Cross overseas, or as shoreside yeomanettes with the Navy. The women's contribution and accomplishment to the war effort could not be denied. By 1917, 11 states had granted full suffrage. In Montana, the women's movement scored a major victory when Jeanette Rankin was voted into the United States House of Representatives to serve as the first woman ever elected to Congress. Rankin began her political career while campaigning for women's suffrage, and helped secure the vote in Montana in 1914. An avowed pacifist, Rankin spoke out against America's entry into the war in 1917, as she would do again during her second term in 1941, making her the only member of Congress to vote against America's entry into both world wars. In Russia, internal political matters had worsened. Tsar Nicholas finally abdicated his throne on March 15, 1917. A provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky took power. However, the new government did not satisfy the expectations of Vladimir Lenin and his radical Bolshevik party, 
who insisted on an end to the war and greater social reform. Lenin and his comrades, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, knew that the time was right to organize an armed insurrection and seize power. The other Bolshevik party members were hesitant at first, but on October 10th, they approved Lenin's plan. Lenin and the Bolsheviks found support from huge numbers of Russian citizens, all looking for a way to stop centuries of autocratic rule by corrupt and ruthless monarchs. Hungry from widespread lack of food and tired of the war that was killing countless Russians, these people would fight to establish a communist government that would care for all its citizens. During the night of October 24th, under the direction of Leon Trotsky, armed workers, soldiers and sailors laid siege to the Winter Palace, headquarters of the provisional government. I knew personally several people of older generation who were present at the Winter Palace. The night that was supposed to be the night of the storm of the Winter Palace. These people told me that there were no real storm. Remarkably, the October Revolution was virtually bloodless. The seizure of power went forward without delay, and by the afternoon of October 25th, it was over. It was very easy uh, for the Bolsheviks to come to power, and different from Kerensky, Lenin wanted to be the, uh, the chief of the central government. Lenin immediately ordered troops on the Eastern Front to stop fighting and open peace talks with Germany. On December 15th, an armistice was signed and the war on the Eastern Front was over. It was also over for the Romanov family. Imprisoned in Siberia shortly after the Tsar's abdication, Nicholas and his family awaited trial. In mid-1918, the Soviet government ordered their execution, bringing an end to the Romanov dynasty that had ruled Russia for three centuries. Civil war continued to embroil Russia, and not until 1922 did Lenin and the Bolsheviks secure political control of the state. In Egypt, the British gained ground under the brilliant leadership of General Edmund Allenby. By December 1917, he pushed through Gaza and took Jerusalem. He then marched north toward Damascus. Allenby's cohort, T.E. Lawrence, was also making history in the region. Lawrence incited a series of successful Arab revolts against Turkish garrisons maintained throughout Arabia. His conquests and writings have engraved the mysterious Lawrence of Arabia into history. By 1918, the Germans were no longer concerned with Russia, and a confident General Ludendorff told the Kaiser they should deliver a blow on the Western Front before the Americans can throw strong forces on the scale. In March of 1918, General Ludendorff led his men from the trenches, breaking the three-year stalemate. Launching a series of strong offensive attacks, they swept across the Aisne River toward Paris. In three days, his forces advanced 45 miles, the most ground gained since the start of the war. Ludendorff kept pushing, shelling Paris, and advancing to within 40 miles of the French capital. By the spring of 1918, American forces under the leadership of General Black Jack Pershing had grown to nearly one million men and were ready for their first major offensive engagements. In late May, the 1st Division drove the Germans from the French village of Cantigny. In June, Americans waged the famous battle at Belleau Wood. Despite serious casualties, American troops routed the Germans from their strategic positions forcing them to retreat. In July, the Americans joined the French at Chateau Thierry, and the combined forces stopped the German advance and then counterattacked, driving the Germans back again. American divisions, plus the French colonial division, were the spearhead of the attack which was made at Soissons. And in two very bitter days of fighting, these three divisions broke through the German line. After that, the Germans never successfully attacked again. From then on, the Germans retreated. 
With his resolve broken, General Ludendorff wrote the Kaiser, the war must be ended, and he urged an armistice with the Allies. The Allies' final offensive began in September 1918. In a three-pronged strike, British, French, and American forces attacked the German line. The American offensive took place between the Meuse River and the Argonne Forest, breaking Germany's principal line of supply and delivering the final blow. At home, the German people grew disillusioned as food supply and economic conditions worsened. With his authority fading, the Kaiser quickly abdicated his throne and fled to neutral Holland. Armistice was finally declared in a railway carriage at Compiègne, France, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. The war was over, and all was quiet on the Western Front. The war had been costly for both sides, nearly $200 billion. Of the approximately 65 million who fought, 10 million had perished, with twice as many wounded. Four million civilians had also been killed. As the war came to an end, the world faced yet another battle, the battle against influenza. The Spanish flu raged across the globe, spreading to the civilian population through soldiers and sailors returning home from the trenches. I survived it. I don't know particularly whether I didn't have it as bad as the rest of them or what. But I was had about three, four weeks I was in that hospital. About three weeks, I guess, I was in that hospital. They died like flies in there. I'd hate to open my eyes in the morning because they'd see some guy going down with a gurney with a tag on his toe. The influenza virus, one of the deadliest in history, infected over one billion people on six continents and killed 21 million worldwide, more than had been wounded in the four years of World War I. At the dawn of 1919, the United States mourned the passing of one of its greatest leaders, Theodore Roosevelt. The former president had remained politically active throughout the war years and was considering another run for president in 1920. However, his poor health worsened with the death of his youngest son, Quentin, who was killed during the war. On the morning of January 6th, Roosevelt died in his sleep from a blood clot in his lungs. He was 60 years of age. 1919 was a dark year for professional sports. Controversy brewed in professional baseball with the Black Sox scandal. The Chicago White Sox lost the World Series that year to the Cincinnati Reds, five games to three. An outcry erupted when several Chicago White Sox baseball players were accused of throwing the World Series in exchange for bribes from professional gamblers. A year later, shoeless Joe Jackson and seven others were acquitted in a court of law, but the league commissioner banned them from baseball for life. By the end of the decade, Hollywood movie making had become a financial juggernaut. In April of 1919, four of Hollywood's biggest players, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and D.W. Griffith, formed the United Artists Corporation to produce and distribute their own films. Despite the repercussions of the war, the German film industry was also booming. And with this boom came the rise of a new cinematic style, German Expressionism. Robert Veen's classic, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, was the first film to incorporate the expressionist style on celluloid. The fantastic use of costume and setting offset the realism of classic Hollywood and ushered in a new wave of filmmaking. Meanwhile, a new form of cinema arose in France as well. Unlike the films of German expressionism, cinema born out of the French Impressionist movement was more concerned with stimulating the emotions of the spectator and utilizing new innovations in camera work to depict the subjectivity of character more intimately. Filmmaker Abel Gantz was a master of this technique and soon became internationally renowned as an auteur of the Impressionistic style. Like German Expressionism, the French Impressionism movement was short-lived 
and by the end of the 1920s, both cinematic forms had become a part of the past. However, despite their decline, the contributions of these forms to the development of film as an art remain timeless. 1919 also marked the establishment of the world's first modernist architectural institution. The Bauhaus, as it is called, was founded in Weimar, Germany, and instantly became the most important school of architecture of its time. However, like many liberal artistic institutions in Germany, it would be dismantled during the Nazi regime. Although the Allies claimed victory, negotiating peace was still to be settled. In January 1919, delegates from 27 nations gathered for the Paris Peace Conference in Versailles, France. At the helm of the conference stood the Council of Four, Italian Premier Orlando, British Prime Minister Lloyd George, French Premier Clemenceau, and American President Woodrow Wilson, who came to Versailles with a 14-point plan to facilitate reconstruction and ensure a lasting peace. Most important the 14th point was the 14th, a League of Nations, an international organization of nations, so that there could be a body that would arbitrate this, this differences and you wouldn't have to have another world war. This was the war to end all wars. Wilson tried to create an entirely new international order. He advanced the proposition that nations only fight when they are not democratic. Therefore, he tried to turn foreign policy into more a kind of a social policy and create democratic nations based on self-determination. He hadn't looked at a map of Europe, but something very hard to achieve. On June 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. The majority of Wilson's moderate proposal, except for a provision for the League of Nations, was revised. The new terms imposed harsh punishment on Germany, including enormous reparations, demilitarization, and the division of its considerable territory amongst the Allies. Wilson returned home and began his grueling campaign to raise support for the Treaty and League of Nations. Even though a majority of people in the U.S. initially had supported a ratification of the treaty, it was never ratified, and eventually the U.S. made a, simply made a, a separate peace with, uh, with Germany and never joined the League of Nations. Wilson's efforts left him exhausted and physically broken. By the beginning of 1920, his health was failing, and he never fully recovered. The peace he fought so hard to secure would soon vanish as the undercurrents of conflict left in the wake of the Great War pulled the world into another two decades later. Woodrow Wilson's last public appearance was in a car on the way to his successor's inauguration. He looked like a broken doll thrown onto a chair. He was, in fact, a broken man, paralyzed, defeated. His legacy was clouded by two famous pronouncements he made about the war. It was a war to end wars, and it was a war to make the world safe for democracy. In fact, neither goal was achieved. It goes ahead of our story, but the only way to make sense of the history we've just recounted is to point out that later events proved that Wilson was more right than wrong. His proposals for making peace with healing Germany rather than with revenge and with America actively joining the world to prevent a future war were rejected by the European leaders and by the American Congress. So World War II followed. But in World War II, America was governed by a figure who had been in Wilson's cabinet as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and who pursued Wilson's ideas. Under American pressure then, Western Europe, the cockpit of wars for 2,000 years, would begin to unite and enjoy the longest period of peace since Roman times. Wars would there, as prescribed by Wilson, end. And the number of democracies in the world would rise from 12 between the wars to 117 by the end of the century in a world made safe for democracy. Wilson was a great school teacher. His record would look better had he also been, like his assistant secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, a great politician. Next time, the decade when the world went a little wild, the 1920s. Next time on the remarkable 20th century. The 1920s is a hard decade to capsulize. Fascinating events tumble over one another so fast, it's hard to tell the important from the trivial. <laughs>